no death, no power in life or death, no sin, no shame, no failure can separate. Today we begin the study of two of the most famous women who have ever lived. In fact, I would say two of the greatest women who have ever lived. And their names are synonymous with greatness. In fact, one of them is in the lineage of Jesus Christ himself. And the other one literally saved the entire nation of Israel. You could say that they both had a part to play in the salvation of Israel because one of them helped ultimately give birth to the Messiah and the other one helped save a nation from the throes of disaster. So we're talking about Ruth and Esther. That's the new series that we're beginning today, studying the lives of these two great heroes or heroines, I guess would be the more appropriate term. And so over the next month, we're gonna be studying the book of Ruth and then the following month, we'll be going through the book of Esther and studying her life as well. And Ruth is amazing as, as well as Esther, but this story touches on so many incredible themes. Um, it's about romance, Nicholas Sparks, watch out. Uh, God had the corner on the romance novel from before the time of, you know, What's that movie with Keanu Reeves? And he's in the, he's in the house. Uh, Tommy's giving me the look. Uh, anyway, God had the corner on the romance novel. And Ruth's story is so beautiful and so romantic and two people falling in love and finding each other. But it also talks a lot about 
family and disappointment and dealing with pain and dealing with frustration with God, things that we can all relate to at different points in our lives. And before we jump into the life of Ruth and studying that book, I want us to talk for a little bit about just the role and the importance of women in general. I think it would really be a miss for us to look at the lives of these two great women and not see that there is a bigger picture and story that God is trying to tell us about who women are from studying their lives. The scripture is consistently elevating the role of women. And our culture would try to have you believe that that is not true, but that is simply not true. I think that we have misunderstood and misplaced women for a long time. There was a, a famous author who talked about how God took Adam's rib and made Eve out of it. And he said that he didn't pull from Adam's head so that Adam would rule over Eve. And he didn't pull from Adam's foot so that Eve would be greater than Adam, but he pulled from Adam's side because men and women were intended to do life together. And God really, from the beginning of time, had made men and women to be equal with one another. That's what the scripture would say. And in ancient culture especially, the role of women was very much devalued and diminished. And so wherever the gospel has gone throughout history, the role of women has gone to a higher place. If you want to thank somebody for how women have been able to go up the ladder in terms of responsibility and leadership and taking on more of a role in what's happening in the world, really at the root of that has to do with the gospel being spread. The, the, the way that Jesus approached women and who they were completely changed the game because throughout most of the world, throughout most of history, women were treated as second-class citizens. They were treated sometimes as the property of men, like just like you would own a table or a chair or a house, you would have a woman. And so when the gospel spread throughout the world, the role of women was elevated and Jesus has liberated women. Jesus had women disciples Jesus had women who followed him. Jesus had women who carried the gospel throughout the earth. And what the Bible has to say about what a woman is, is a very beautiful picture to behold. Women are supposed to be dignified. They're beautiful. They're regal. And in fact, they are ultimately going to be royalty, is what the scripture would say. Listen to this quote by, by somebody that you might actually be surprised by. A guy named John MacArthur had this to say about what the Bible has to say about women. And sometimes you might not think that he would say this, but it says, contrast all of ancient and contemporary from the Bible, from cover to cover, the Bible exalts women. In fact, it often seems to go out of the way to pay homage to them to ennoble their roles in society and family, to acknowledge the importance of their influence, and to exalt the virtues of women who were particularly godly examples. From the very first chapter of the Bible, we are taught that women, like men, bear the stamp of God's own image. Men and women were created equal. Women play prominent roles in many key biblical narratives. Wives are seen as venerated partners and cherished companions to their husbands, not merely slaves or pieces of furniture, you see, the gospel has liberated women and still continues to. Wherever there is a country or a region of the world that the gospel has not penetrated, you will see the roles of women being diminished and women being oppressed. We have the gospel to thank for the way that women's rights have advanced throughout the world. And the scripture says in Romans eight seventeen this about men and women, it says that we are heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, co-heirs with Christ. And so men and women are going to rule over creation. God's plan for men and women equally is that they would rule over the new heavens and the new earth. Women are going to have just as much 
of the inheritance as men are when it comes to the new kingdom that God's going to usher in. Women are leaders. Women are royalty. Women are bosses. And I think our world misunderstands the role of women either in trying to oppress them or in trying to make them into something that God has not intended them to be. And so sometimes women have to kind of try to figure out what their role is and and what God intends for them and what their image should be. And the Bible always puts the emphasis on the beauty of women being in their character, not their outward appearance merely. And as much as we would tout equality today in our world, in this country, and talk about how women can do everything that men can do, I think that there is still an inordinate amount of emphasis placed on the appearance of women and that indicating their value in society. But the Bible would always say that what makes someone beautiful, especially a woman, is not her outward appearance, but her character. The Bible says that beauty comes from the inside. And as we continue to show what God has said about women, it enables them to be able to come into their highest places of of esteem, their highest places in this society, in this world. And I think that God has the best plan for women imaginable. And if we were to study the lives of Ruth and Esther, and this will come up kind of continually throughout these books, if we were to study their lives and not understand this, then then we would really be missing a big point of what God is trying to tell us through naming two books of the Bible after Ruth and Esther, which to give them such prominence, especially in the ancient world, would have been revolutionary. And as we study them, I believe that we're going to see the women in our church and the women that are going to interact with this content rise into the great things that God has for them. So are you ready to study the lives of Ruth and Esther? Next month is actually uh, Women's Appreciation Month, so I'm really excited that we get to study the book of Esther throughout that month. And this month is Black History Month, and we're going to spend some time honoring our black brothers and sisters as well. But today we're going to begin the book of Ruth, just the first six verses. It's just kind of an introduction into this story that's really, really beautiful and I think is really gonna encourage you. So can we pray together as we get into this? God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the people who are watching today. I pray that this message would encourage them, would uplift them. Maybe some that have had the wrong idea of who God has called them to be or who women are. I pray that their perspective would get changed and that they would see the beauty and the elegance and the incredible things that you have in store for the women in their life and for them. And I just pray that you would speak to us through your word, through this book that is timeless. And uh, we pray that you would open our hearts to hear from you. And I pray you would use me in Jesus' name. Amen. Can you say amen in the chat? Amen. Book of Ruth, chapter one. I've called this message The bread ran out. The bread ran out. Um, Or, in brackets, return to the house. Return to the house. Funny about bread, bread is a big deal, in case you didn't know. I think there has probably never been a point in history where you have been more defined by what you do or do not do with bread. Right? I mean, are you gluten-free? Are you trying to get rid of carbs? Are you eating or avoiding bread? Are you having some kind of substitute for bread? It's such a huge deal. Your diet is a huge deal in our world today, and everybody has their opinion on what you should be doing. I had some friends who at the beginning of kind of like the gluten-free craze, they said that they were going to start a company called Gluttony, like gluttony, gluttony, and they were going to add extra gluten to things, like glute snacks for the kids, Um, you know, I don't know what else you would do, but it was, it was just a joke. But in the old Testament, in the book that we're reading today, bread was much more than just, you know, kind of like this side thing. Are you going to eat it or not? Or are you going to include it in your diet? Bread was everything. Bread was your life source. 
bread was what you needed to survive. And so when the bread runs out, then that means that your life is going to ultimately end. And so back in the Old Testament, when there was a famine in the land, that literally meant people were not going to be able to eat food. Now, in, in our world today, although there is much of the world that still does suffer from hunger, but in our world today, especially in the Western world, we're not as concerned with literal bread, like where, where is our food going to come from? That's not our concern as much. I think a better comparison for bread in our day would be the economy. Like, how's the stock market doing? How are businesses? How's the economy? And when there is like a depression or a decline in the economy, then our life starts to change. And that's kind of like our life source. And so when you read in the Old Testament about there was a famine in the land, think about like it was the Great Depression or there was a recession or there was a, a crash in the world economy. That's kind of like maybe something that would be similar to what was happening back then. So I say all this to set up our story today because it's going to start off with this. Ruth chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the days when judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. And a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi. And the names of his two, son, two sons were Malon and Chilion. Um, not going to recommend those names to you if you're thinking about naming your kid, but to each their own. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem and Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah and the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about 10 years, and both Malon and Chilion died, so that the woman who was left without her two sons and husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. I told you that we're calling this message, the bread ran out. So there's a famine in the land and uh, Naomi and her husband decide to leave the promised land, to leave God's country, to leave the place that God had given them as a nation, and to go to this place called Moab. Now, Moab is symbolic in Scripture of being like the almost promised land, meaning just it's just short of the promised land. It's kind of like symbolic of almost compromise because it's real close to the promised land and there's maybe some good things about the land of Moab, but it's not the fullness of what God had intended for the children of Israel. It's, it's not the, the land of milk and honey that's overflowing as God wanted for them. So Moab is this place of compromise. And Naomi and her family, because of a hard economic circumstance, decided to leave the promised land and to go to the land of compromise, the land of Moab. I wonder how many times in our lives, maybe even something that we're dealing with right now, where there's been a hardship that's happened wherever we've been, somewhere that God's called us to be. And as a result of that hardship, we've just decided to say, you know what, I'm looking around and this doesn't seem too promising right now, even though I'm in the promised land. And so I'm going to go ahead and jettison from this place, peace out, and I'm going to go to the land of Moab, where my prospects look a little bit better than they do here right now. I mean, like just practically speaking, I think an example would be maybe times are tough for you. Maybe your job isn't coming through in the way that you need it to, or maybe uh, you're some kind of independent contractor and people aren't hiring you. And so something props up or, or comes up that can pay you a lot of money, but it's going to mean that you have to compromise in something that you believe. And so instead of staying in the promised land where there is some hardship right now, you've decided that you're going to go to where you know you can get food for you, you and your family. 
and you end up in the land of compromise. And the problem that happens when you do that is you might think, oh, it's just this once. I, I, I just need this to make it from this point to this point, and then it's over. But look what happened to Naomi and her family. It says that they went to the land of Moab in verse 2 and remained there. The land of Moab pulls you in and it keeps you for a while. You think that you're just going for a short trip. You think that you're just going because things got rough and you need something to get you by. But what happens is time goes on and time progresses and you end up staying in the land of compromise. Ian Duguid, who wrote a great commentary on the books of Ruth and Esther, he said, once entered in, the road to continued and deepened disobedience is often smoothly paved and provides little resistance. Once you take one step of compromise, it's easier to take the next and the next. And how many know that the devil's not gonna make your path hard to not follow God's plan. He's gonna make it as easy as possible. Another example is maybe literally you were having a hard time in the city, in the place that God had called you to. And so instead of sticking it out, you said, I'm literally gonna pick up and move to somewhere else. And you did it without thinking about the consequences of that spiritually. You only thought about getting the paycheck, getting the money, and you didn't think about what's gonna to happen to my family if I uproot them from the house of God that we're planted in and bring them to somewhere that they're unfamiliar with and that we have no community and no connection to real discipleship and we're just like kind of out on our own. Moab is symbolic in the scripture of compromise and it's a place that I believe that Naomi and her family should have not ever gone to. And what happens when you go to Moab is that it takes a lot from you. You think that you're going to get something from it, but in reality, it takes so much more than it gives. Look at what happened when they were in Moab. First of all, Naomi's husband passes away. They experienced tragedy. They thought they were going to a place that was going to sustain them and give them longer life, but instead it shortened their life. And then time passes and her sons, Malon and Chilion, because they're removed from God's place that he had called them to, they end up marrying women who were unequally yoked with them, like women who didn't have the same faith as them, women who didn't understand the same God as them. And so now what's happened is that their kids have also followed along on this path of compromise and disobedience. Think about the, the repercussions for your family when you decide to step out of where God has called you and to go somewhere else that might seem easier at the time. Long term, it's not a smart decision. And then eventually, Naomi loses both of her children as well. My point is just this. Moab may seem great. It may seem enticing but it's gonna take so much more from you than it's gonna to give to you. Moab is not where you wanna be. You want to be in the promised land. You wanna be where God has called you to be. You wanna be in the middle of God's will. You're never gonna get ahead by compromise. I mean, Jesus said in Matthew, he said, seek first the kingdom of God, and then these things will be added unto you. God knows what you need. And if you put him first and say, I'm going to make God the priority in my life and everything else is going to come underneath that instead of I'm going to make th the money that I need the priority in my life and everything else is going to come under that. When you flip it and you put God at, at the first, he's going to make sure you have everything you need. He's going to make sure that your family is taken care of. And he's going to make sure that your family is surrounded by this beautiful spiritual atmosphere that will hopefully transfer to them and that they will follow in your footsteps as somebody who is following God yourself. Reprioritize your life. Don't, don't put the emphasis on the wrong things. Put the emphasis on the right things. Put God first and then put everything else. 
God and then your spouse and then your family and then your job. And you will find that when things are in the right order, God blesses that. Don't just weigh opportunities based on the benefit to your bank account. Weigh opportunities based on what is this going to cost me and my family spiritually. Like, yes, this might seem great, but in the long run, is it going to take more from me than it's actually giving to me? I just read a story about Chris Tucker. Remember Rush Hour? And Friday? And like, I don't even, I haven't seen a movie with Chris Tucker in it forever. But Chris Tucker recently turned down a multi-million, I think it was somewhere around $15 million role in a movie. Because what the role would have required for him to do was going to compromise his beliefs. That's a lot of money to say no to. And, and I'm not pointing to Chris Tucker as the person that we should all follow, but I love the fact that he was willing to stand for something even though it was going to cost him a lot financially. So if something is going to take me away from God's house, if something's going to take me away from God's place that he's called me to and from God's people, it's not worth it. I, I'm not going to let that slide for the sake of other things. I'm not going to be a sports parent and make sure that my kid is at every athletic event known to man and let them skip out on being a part of God's house because I want them to kind of live out my dreams as an athlete that I never got to fulfill. Sorry, that's kind of a weirdly specific example, but like there's so many of us that we'll make sure that the kids are at soccer. We'll make sure that the kids are at dance practice in ballet. And we'll make sure that the kids are this and that. But we aren't putting the priority on making sure that they're getting to church and being in God's house. And when your child grows up and is not a professional athlete, are you going to be wishing that you had taken them to soccer on Saturday or that you had got them to church on Sunday? I'm just saying, where is the priority in our lives. And I think that even though there's lots of things that can pull us out of God's house, one of the biggest things is always this. It's always money. It's always an opportunity. It's always something where we can make more dollars. And I think we just have to put the priority on, I'm going to put my priority on being planted in God's house. Bethlehem where Naomi and her family left from, it means house of bread. House of bread. If they would have stayed there, God would have provided for them. It means house of bread because it was referring to the bread of presence that would have been in the tabernacle. And, and the bread of pre presence is actually symbolic pointing to Jesus. Remember when Jesus had the Last Supper with his disciples, he said, take and eat this. This is my body that's been broken for you, his bread. Jesus called himself the bread of life. Jesus is the source of life, not our physical bread, not the economy, not our paychecks. Jesus is the source of life. And I believe that God is calling some people today back to Bethlehem, back to the house of bread, back to the place where you can be planted in God's house. And if you do that, listen to what Psalm 37, 25 says. I have been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. God's going to make sure you get what you need if you follow him first. So, Naomi, she now has two daughter-in-laws. She has a family that she's acquired since the time they've been in Moab, but they're coming back without any of the men in their life. Her husband is dead. Her sons are dead. And she hears that there is food again in Israel, in Bethlehem. And so they decide that they're going to come back. Verse 6, it says, Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. Listen, the long road back to God, all it really takes is starting with one step. 
Naomi realized that she had been living in a place of compromise and she decides to just take one step back. The, the journey back home, you might be worried like, oh, I'm going to be so embarrassed. I haven't been around God's people in a long time. I've been off doing this other thing and I've been doing this and that. And then you're like, you're worried because how are people going to think about this? How are people going to perceive me? Listen, when you take one step, that's all it takes. Don't, don't worry about all the consequence of what's going to happen or all the sequential steps afterwards. Just, just think about the first step. And we're going to see next week that when Naomi and Ruth get back to Bethlehem, that the whole town starts buzzing. And when you come back to God's house, there is an excitement of the people to see you again. They're not going to like shun you or judge you or be upset with you. They're just going to be glad that you made that decision to come back. I believe that this message is timely as I was studying this chapter. I can't wait to go through the rest of the book of Ruth. There's so much great stuff in here. But I, I just felt like it was sim symbolic and I felt like it was sensitive for this time right now because I think there's just some people that God's calling you back. Now is the time. You've lived in the land of Moab for too long. You've lived in the land of compromise for too long. And grace always gets the final word. God's not mad at you. He's not angry with you. God wants to restore you. God wants to bless you. And if you come back to him, he is more than willing to pour out grace upon you. It doesn't matter how much stuff you've done that's wrong. It doesn't matter how long you've been away. If you would just turn around and take that one step, God would meet you right there. And he would embrace you and he would restore you. And he would give you that brand new start and forgive you of everything that you've done that's wrong and just bring you back into his embrace. And even though it's going to take a while for Naomi to experience this, she is going to experience this. And God's going to do literal miracles in her life. But it all started by that one step, that journey back to Bethlehem back to the house of bread. So we're going to continue this story next week. And if you're here today and you need to make a commitment to say, hey, I'm going to start following God again. I'm tired of the compromise. I want to live for him. Then here's what I want you to do is in the chat right now, I just want you to somehow signify, hey, that's me. And I need to kind of start this journey again with God. Maybe it's raising a hand emoji or just typing, it's me. Maybe it's sending a text to somebody who is a friend of yours who you know is following Jesus and saying, hey, I need to get back into church. I need to get back around God's people. It doesn't mean that like tomorrow, everything is gonna just go back to the way that it was. There might be some time for that process to take place, but God is going to fully redeem everything. And God's going to fully forgive and fully give you grace. So if that's you today, you can signify that in the chat. Or maybe you're like, well, I'm kind of a little bit nervous about doing that publicly. Listen, there's no shame. There's no shame here. This is the place, God's house, the church, this is the place where shame has no place. This is the place where you can walk in freedom and liberty. So nobody's going to judge you. Nobody's going to think worse of you. Everybody's just going to be happy for you. And there's also going to come up in the chat in just a moment a link, and my wife will tell you about that, of how you can um, get more connected. Because we all need connection in this journey with God. It's not just enough to like, uh, you know, kind of be from a distance or, or just say, oh, that's cool with me, but we have no connection. We need connection with God's people to really walk into all that God has for us. So my prayer for you today is that you would, like Naomi, begin this road and this journey back to Bethlehem, and that as you do, you would see God restore to you the years that the locusts have eaten. That's a, a reference to the book of Jeremiah where Israel had suffered a plague from disobedience. And God said, hey, if you come back, I'm gonna restore the years. The time that you spent away, it's gonna be like somehow he just redeems it all and pulls it all in together. And even though it's been years, he puts like a year's worth of awesome stuff into like a short period of time and brings it all together in a way that only he can. So I, I want you to walk in God's grace, his love, his forgiveness today. 
And I want you to know that that can start right now. Would you pray with me? God, I just pray for any person who is deciding to make that commitment to follow you today. I pray you'd meet them. I pray you'd change them. I pray this would be the beginning of a fresh start for them. And like I said before, if that's you, whether you're coming back to God or whether there's maybe some people right now who they just want to start this journey with God. You, you didn't grow up around church. You haven't been around uh, faith and, and people who are following God. Like this is new for you, but you want this and you need this. I want you to, to make this commitment today and say this to God in your heart. Say, dear God, I give my life to you. I turn away from my sin and I turn to you as my savior. Come into me and change me and make me new. I surrender to you in Jesus' name, amen. Hey, come on, let's give it up for those doing that today. Give it up for them in the chat. If you're watching anywhere and you just want to let out a shout or clap, that is totally appropriate. Um, we're so glad to have been able to be a part of what God's doing in your life today. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to my wife and she's going to let you know some more instructions of how you can get connected. Um, thank you to everyone who partners with us financially and makes this possible. Thank you for your generosity. All the ways to give are going to come up on the screen if you'd like to uh, invest into what God's doing through this church and this movement. We couldn't do it without you. And we believe God has more territory he wants to take through this ministry and this church. So as you give, you're a part of what God is doing through this. So we'd love if you would partner with us. And uh, here's my wife who's gonna close out our time together. We love you so much. Can't wait to see you next week. Uh, Emily here. I just wanted to wrap up this online service today. We hope that today's message has been such a blessing to you, kicking off this new series, Ruth and Esther. I know that we're all taking a lot from it and able to move forward with that. And I'm excited for the rest of this series. I know Pastor Josh has been praying and preparing and just has um, really a lot of things on his heart to share. So I'm excited for the continuation of the series. But we just wanted to take a moment and let you know about some things that are happening in the church. The reason that we take a moment to do that, because I know it can kind of feel like, all right, the service has been long enough. I don't need to know these things. But the reason that we do that is because we want you to feel connected. We want to show you that it's important that you know what's happening at the church so that you feel like you can come in and you can know what's happening and you can know what to expect and you can be a part of it because the whole reason that we offer that is so that you have a place to feel at home, a place for community. So we always take time to let you know what is happening. So this Wednesday, uh, we have a dinner party coming up. It's gonna be at Nate Fisher's house. Nate um, runs our welcome team. He does an amazing job and he hosts one of our awesome dinner parties. So this Wednesday at 7 p.m., it's gonna be in the downtown Detroit area. Uh, if you've never been to a dinner party before, if you've been to, the, to a dinner party and it's been in the past, or if you don't even go to the church but you're looking for community, all of those things are great reasons to be a part of a dinner party. So you can uh, message us on Instagram. You can send us a email to info at crossanchorchurch.com. And we would love to get you connected into a dinner party. And um, it's really low pressure situation. There's food, there's conversation, and there's people that care about you and wanna do life with you and wanna pray for you. And it's really a blessing. And so definitely think about coming to that on Wednesday. Then next Sunday, February 13th, is Super Bowl Sunday, which is a big deal to a lot of people. And we have a Super Bowl party um, right here, or right at Eightfold where we meet for our in-person services. It's gonna be at 6 p.m. and it's gonna be awesome. And you can just wear your favorite jersey. I don't even know who's playing this year, but I'm sure it's gonna be a lot of fun. There will be food and all the things. You don't have to RSVP, but we would love to see you. It'll be just like a fun time to hang out. Um, last thing I wanted to say is right here in the chat on your screen, uh, there's a link where, that you can click for a connect card. This is the way for us to know if you made a decision for Christ, if you um, are new to the church and you want to get connected, if you have questions, if you want to get baptized, if you want to go through a next steps class, all of that, you can fill that out at that link. And we would love, love, love for you to take a moment to do that. And our team will get back in touch with you. So again, thank you for being here with us online. We hope it's been a really special, significant Sunday for you. And we will see you again next week at 1030.